Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today's video is going to be about heart failure as part of our cardiology series. Heart failure is by definition the inability of the myocardium to provide effective circulation to the tissues of the body. There are different approaches to classify the disease. It can either be acute or chronic, depending on the onset. Acute heart failure is a medical emergency. It develops quickly and requires immediate medical attention. It is characterized by a sudden onset of symptoms with fast progression. Chronic heart failure on the other side develops slowly and often takes years to require medical treatment. Heart failure can also be classified according to the part of the heart that is affected. So it can either be left-sided heart failure, right-sided heart failure, or total heart failure. Left-sided heart failure originates from systemic conditions such as hypertension, which lead to the buildup and backing up of blood into the pulmonary circulation, which causes dyspnea and indoratio fusca pulmonum. Right-sided heart failure usually is a result from left-sided heart failure and rarely occurs individually. About right and left-sided heart failure, we will talk more in separate videos. Heart failure can also be classified according to the time it can be observed, so it can be either systolic or diastolic. Also, the amount of blood that is being pumped is essential for differentiation of the type of heart failure. Here we usually distinguish either low output or high output heart failure. The last type of classification I want to mention is the differentiation into forward or backward heart failure depending on the cause of strain that is put on the heart, so whether it originated in the lungs or the body. Causes of heart failure are even more abundant than the types we can differentiate. It can be caused by general weakening of the body by aging, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, different conduction disorders or valve disorders. The causes we will discuss more comprehensively when we will speak more about the left and right sided heart failure. The next point I want to talk about is the mechanism of heart failure. There are a couple of factors which promote the development of cardiac dysfunction. One of them is the loss of contractility, so a decrease in the strength with which the heart contracts. This can be caused among others by calcium imbalance, hypertension, dilatation, the loss of contractility will lead to a systolic dysfunction, meaning the blood cannot be ejected from the ventricles as the heart cannot pump sufficiently. If the blood is not pumped out effectively in systole, this automatically means that the stroke volume will be reduced. The stroke volume is the difference between the end diastolic and the end systolic volume of the heart. So basically how much blood the heart pumps out with every beat. A decrease in the stroke volume can also be caused by diastolic dysfunction, so improper filling of the ventricles in the relaxation phase. This can be due to a decrease in compliance, which we can observe in restrictive cardiomyopathy. If you haven't seen that video yet, you can click on the banner above, or it can also be caused by stiffening of the cardiac valves. The decrease in the stroke volume leads to decreased cardiac output. The cardiac output was earlier called minute volume, which helps us to remember that a cardiac output is the amount of blood that is pumped out of the heart in one time unit, usually one minute. When the heart distributes less blood to the peripheral tissues, those will experience ischemia, which will cause symptoms of cyanosis, dyspnea, fatigue and dizziness. The body will try to fight these symptoms by attempting to compensate for the cardiac malfunction. This compensatory response includes hypertrophy of the cardiac muscle, since more muscle means more strength, right? And also in the dilatation of the chambers to basically give the chamber more room to fill properly. But also the dilatation is due to the systolic dysfunction as the blood cannot leave the heart sufficiently. These responses will lead to an increase in the peripheral resistance. The peripheral resistance is the resistance that the blood vessels have against the, blow, the blood flowing through them. When the blood vessels constrict, so narrow their lumen, 
the resistance increases. When you dilate, the pressure decreases. A higher resistance also means a higher pressure, and so an in increase in blood pressure. As the pressure increases, more blood is pumped back to the heart at higher speed and higher pressure. So the ventricular afterload also increases. The afterload is the pressure against which the heart has to work to be able to eject the blood in systole, systole. As the vessels are more constricted due to the higher peripheral resistance, the heart automatically has to pump harder, which will put more strain on it. If it is not able to overcome that strain, that means a decrease in stroke volume again. And so the circle closes. I hope this was understandable. I know it is a lot when everything is connected. As I mentioned during the explanation of the mechanism, there are a few symptoms that patients classically experience. Those are fatigue, palpitations, which are arrhythmical beats, dyspnea, which is a difficulty in breathing, chest pain, also called angina pectoris, and syncopes, which is fainting due to a sudden decrease in blood pressure. The severity and extent of symptoms helps us to determine how far the disease has already progressed. The New York Heart Association, short NIHA, formulated a classification which is frequently used in clinical practice. They divided the disease into four stages, one being the mildest and four being the most severe. In stage one, patients have none of the symptoms I mentioned earlier and are able to perform normal physical activity. In stage two, Patients have mild symptoms when they follow a normal physical activity. Stage 3 and 4 are those that are usually observed in the doctor's offices and hospitals as patients feel progressively weak. In stage 3, patients have moderate symptoms with less than normal activity and only experience comfort and rest. They will avoid certain activities which they could do before. In stage 4, Patients experience severe symptoms at any given time, so at minimal activity but also at rest. There is no cure for heart failure, as the damage to the cardiac walls and blood vessels will not be reversed, but medications can help to support the heart and alleviate symptoms. Medications frequently used are ACE inhibitors, which especially help in systolic heart failure, angiotensin II receptor blockers, beta blockers, diuretic, aldosterone antagonists, enotropes, and digoxine. First-line treatment is usually a combination of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Statistics have proven that, it, that they decrease morbidity and mortality. Diuretics are given to reduce edema and dyspnea due to collection of fluid when the blood cannot flow back to the heart properly or backs up into the lungs. They decrease the pressure in the pulmonary circulation but the stroke volume and cardiac output will decrease initially as the body loses more fluid than normally, so patients might feel lightheaded, dizzy and tired in the initial treatment with diuretics. If this was not your first time you talked about heart failure in med school, you probably want to know a little bit more about the medications and where in the cycle of the mechanism they act, so let's talk about that. Beta agonists have a positive inotropic and chronotropic effect on the heart. This means that they increase the cardiac contractility and the heart rate. This leads also to an increase in blood pressure. They also cause an increase in the intracellular calcium, which increases contractility. Digoxine, a cardiac glycoside, binds to and inhibits the membrane-bound alpha unit of the sodium-potassium ATPase, so it has an effect on the in and efflux of sodium and potassium which leads to an increase in the calcium concentration in the cardiac muscle cells, and so it has a positive inotropic effect. If you want to know more about digoxine, you can click on the banner above. Digoxine is also said to increase the sensitivity of the baroreceptors and stimulates the vagus nerve at the heart, which explains the negative chromotropic effect. Medications that act on the compliance are nitroglycerin and hydralesin. Those are vasodilative and so reduce the, reduce the ventricular afterload. The vasodilation reduces blood pressure and peripheral vascular resistance and so makes it easier for the blood to flow through the blood vessels and back to the heart. Beta blockers block the effect of epinephrine, 
the modulator of the sympathetic nervous system. They have a negative inotropic and chronotropic effect and decrease peripheral vascular resistance. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers, short ARBs, help to improve systems of peripheral and pulmonary edema, so they reduce swelling and help the patient to breathe more easily. ARBs block angiotensin II, so they work antihypertensive. If you have any questions to ACE inhibitors, you can click on the banner above. With this, we conclude this introduction to heart failure. I hope it was helpful. Soon we will continue to talk more detailed about the different types of heart failure. Would be amazing if you would support us with a subscription. Thank you very much.